This is a reading from The Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Anne Catherine Emmerich. Chapter 26, The Crowning with Thorns. No sooner did Sister Emmerich recommence the narrative of her visions on the Passion than she again became extremely ill. Oppressed with fever and so tormented by violent thirst that her tongue was perfectly parched and contracted, and on the Monday, after mid-Lent Sunday, she was so exhausted that it was not without great difficulty, and after many intervals of rest, that she narr narrated all which our Lord suffered in his crowning with thorns. She was scarcely able to speak, because she herself felt every sensation which she described in the following account. Pilate harangued the populace many times during the time of the scourging of Jesus, but they interrupted him once and vociferated, He shall be executed even if we die for it. When Jesus was led into the guardhouse, they all cried out again, Crucify him! Crucify him! After this, there was silence for a time. Pilate occupied himself in giving different orders to the soldiers, and the servants of the high priest brought them some refreshments, after which Pilate, whose superstitious tendencies made him uneasy in mind, went into the inner part of his palace in order to consult his gods and to offer them incense. When the Blessed Virgin and the Holy Women had gathered up the blood of Jesus, with which the pillar and the adjacent parts were saturated, they left the form and went into a neighboring small house, the owner of which I do not know. John was not, I think, present at the scourging of Jesus. A gallery encircled the inner court of the guardhouse, where our Lord was crowned with thorns, and the doors were open. The cowardly ruffians who were eagerly waiting to gratify their cruelty by torturing and insulting our Lord were about fifty in number, and the greatest part slaves or servants of the jailers and soldiers. The mob gathered round the building but were soon displaced by a thousand Roman soldiers who were drawn up in good order and stationed there. Although forbidden to leave their ranks, these soldiers nevertheless did their utmost by laughter and applause to incite the cruel executioners to redouble their insults and as public applause gives fresh energy to a comedian, so did their words of encouragement increase tenfold the cruelty of these men. In the middle of the court there stood the fragment of a pillar, and on it was placed a very low stool, which these cruel men maliciously covered with sharp flints and bits of broken potsherds. Then they tore off the garments of Jesus, thereby reopening all his wounds, threw over his soldier, uh, shoulders an old scarlet mantle which barely reached his knees, dragged him to the seat prepared, and pushed him roughly down upon it, having first placed the crown of thorns upon his head. The crown of thorns was made of three branches plaited together, the greatest part of the thorns being purposely turned inwards so as to pierce our Lord's head. Having first placed these twisted branches on his forehead, they tied them to tightly together at the back of his head, and no sooner was this accomplished to their satisfaction then they put a large reed into his hand, doing all with derisive gravity, as if they were really crowning him king. They then seized the reed and struck his head so violently that his eyes were filled with blood. They knelt before him, derided him, spat in his face, and buffeted him, buffeted him, saying at the same time, Hail, king of the Jews! Then they threw down his stool, pulled him up again, up from the ground, on which he had fallen, and reseated him with the greatest possible brutality. It is quite impossible to describe the cruel outrages which were thought of and perpetrated by these monsters under human form. The sufferings of Jesus from thirst, caused by the fever which his wounds and sufferings had brought on, were intense. Footnote. These meditations on the sufferings of Jesus filled Sister Emmerich with such feelings of compassion that she begged of God to allow her to suffer as he had done. She instantly became feverish and parched with thirst, and by morning was speechless from the contraction of her tongue and of her lips. She was in this state when her friend came to her in the morning, and she looked like a victim which had just been sacrificed. Those around succeeded, with some difficulty, in moistening her mouth with a little water, but it was long before she could give any further details concerning her meditations on the Passion. He trembled all over, his flesh was torn piecemeal, his tongue contracted, and the only refreshment he received was the blood 
which trickled from his head onto his parched lips. This shameful scene was protracted a full half hour, and the Roman soldiers continued during the whole time to applaud and encourage the perpetration of still greater outrages. Chapter 27. Ecce Homo. The, the cruel executioners then reconducted our Lord to Pilate's palace, with the scarlet cloak still thrown over his shoulders, the crown of thorns on his head, and the reed in his fettered hands. He was perfectly unrecognizable, his eyes, mouth, and beard being covered with blood, his body but one wound, and his back bowed down as that of an aged man, while every limb trembled as he walked. When Pilate saw him standing at the entrance of his tribunal, even he, hard-hearted as he usually was, started and shuddered with horror and compassion, whilst the barbarous priests and the populace, far from being moved to pity, continued their insults and mockery. When Jesus had ascended the stairs, Pilate came forward. The trumpet was sounded to announce that the governor was about to speak, and he addressed, he addressed the chief priests and the bystanders in the following words, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no cause in him. The archers then led Jesus up to Pilate, that the people might again feast their cruel eyes on him, in the state of degradation to which he was reduced. Terrible and heartrending, indeed, was the spectacle he presented, and an exclamation of horror burst from the multitude, followed by a dead silence, when he, with difficulty, raised his wounded head, crowned as it was with thorns, and cast his exhausted glance at the excited throng. Pilate exclaimed as he pointed out him out to the people, Ecce homo, behold the man. The hatred of the high priests and their followers was, if possible, increased at the sight of Jesus, and they cried out, Put him to death, crucify him. Are you not content, said Pilate? The punishment he has received is, beyond question, sufficient to deprive him of all desire of making himself king. But they cried out the more and the multitude joined in the cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate then sounded the trumpet to demand silence and said, Take you him and crucify him, for I find no cause in him. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, replied the priests, because he made himself the Son of God. These words, he made himself the Son of God, revived the fears of Pilate. He took Jesus into another room and asked him, Whence art thou? But Jesus made no answer. Speakest thou not to me? said Pilate. Now, knowest, now, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Thou shouldst not have any power against me, replied Jesus, unless it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered thee, me to thee hath the greater sin. The undecided weak conduct of Pilate filled Claudia Proclus with anxiety. She again sent him the pledge to remind him of his promise, but he only returned a vague, superstitious answer, importing that he should leave the decision of the case to the gods. The enemies of Jesus, the high priests and the Pharisees, having heard of the efforts which were being made by Claudia to save him, caused the report to be spread among the people that the partisans of our Lord had seduced her, that he would be released and then join the Romans and bring about the destruction of Jerusalem and the extermination of the Jews. Pilate was in such a state of indecision and uncertainty as to be perfectly beside himself. He did not know what step to take next and again addressed himself to the enemies of Jesus, declaring that he found no crime in him, but they demanded his death still more clamorously. He then remembered the contradictory accusations which had been brought against Jesus, the mysterious dreams of his wife, and the unaccountable impression which the words of Jesus had made on himself, and therefore determined to question him again, in order thus to obtain some information which might enlighten him as to the course he ought to pursue. He therefore returned to the praetorium, went alone into a room, and sent for the Saviour. He glanced at the mangled and bleeding form before him, and exclaimed inwardly, Is it possible that he can be God? Then he turned to Jesus and adjured him to tell him if he was God, if he was that king who had been promised to the Jews, where his kingdom was, and to what class of gods he belonged. 
I can only give the sense of the words of Jesus, but they were solemn and severe. He told him that his kingdom was not of this world, and he likewise spoke strongly of the many hidden crimes with which the conscience of Pilate was defiled, warned him of the dreadful fate which would be his if he did not repent, and finally declared that he himself, the Son of Man, would come at the last day to profound to pronounce a just judgment upon him. Pilate was half frightened and half angry at the words of Jesus. He returned to the balcony and again declared that he would release Jesus. But they cried out, If thou release this man, thou art not Caesar's friend. For whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Others said that they would accuse him to the emperor of having disturbed their festival, that he must make up his mind at once because they were obliged to be in the temple by 10 o'clock at night. The cry, crucify him, crucify him, resounded on all sides. It re-echoed even from the flat roofs of the houses near the forum, where many persons were assembled. Pilate saw that all his efforts were vain, that he could make no impression on the infuriated mob. Their yells and imprecations were deafening, and he began to fear an insurrection. Therefore he took water and washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. A frightful and unanimous cry then came from the dense multitude who were assembled from all parts of Palestine. His blood be upon us and upon our children. Chapter 28. Reflections on the Visions. Whenever, during my meditations on the Passion of our Lord, I imagine I hear that frightful cry of the Jews, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Visions of a wonderful and terrible description display before my eyes at the same moment the effect of that solemn curse. I fancy I see a gloomy sky covered with clouds of the color of blood from which issue fiery swords and darts lowering over the vociferating multitude and this curse which they have entailed upon themselves, appears to me to penetrate even to the very marrow of their bones, even to the unborn infants. They appear to me encompassed on all sides by darkness. The words they utter take, in my eyes, the form of black flames, which recoil upon them, penetrating the bodies of some and only playing around others. The last mentioned were those who were converted after the death of Jesus, and who were in considerable numbers, for neither Jesus nor Mary ever ceased praying in the midst of their suffering, sufferings for the salvation of these miserable beings. When, during the vision of this kind, I turn my thoughts to the holy souls of Jesus and Mary and to those of the enemies of Christ, all that takes place within them is shown me under various forms. I see numerous devils among the crowd, exciting and encouraging the Jews, whispering in their ears, entering their mouths, inciting them still more against Jesus, but nevertheless trembling at the sight of his ineffable love and heavenly patience. Innumerable angels surrounded Jesus, Mary, and the small number of saints who were there. The exterior of these angels denotes the office they fill. Some represent consolation, others prayer, or some of the works of mercy. I likewise often see consolatory and at other times menacing voices, voices under the appearance of bright or colored gleams of light issuing from the mouth of these different apparitions. And I see the feelings of their souls, their interior sufferings, and in a word, their every thought under the appearance of dark or bright rays. I then understand everything perfectly, but it is impossible for me to give an explanation to others. Besides which, I am so ill and so totally overcome by the grief which I feel for my own sins and for those of the world. I am so overpowered by the sight of the sufferings of our Lord that I can hardly imagine how it is possible for me to relate events with the slightest coherency. Many of these things, but more especially the apparitions of devils and of angels, which are related by other persons who have had visions of the passion of Jesus Christ, are fragments of symbolical interior perceptions of this species, which vary according to the state of the soul of the spectator. Hence, the numerous contradictions, because many things are naturally forgotten or omitted. 
Sister Emmerich sometimes spoke on these subjects, either during the time of her vision, visions on the Passion, or before they commenced, but she more often refused to speak at all concerning them for fear of causing confusion in the visions. It is easy to see how difficult it must have been for her in the midst of such a variety of apparitions to preserve any degree of connection in her, narr in her narrations, who can therefore be surprised at finding some omissions and confusion in her descriptions. Chapter 29, Jesus Condemned to be Crucified. Pilate, who did not desire to know the truth, but was solely anxious to get out of the difficulty without harm to himself, became more undecided than ever. His conscience whispered, Jesus is innocent. His wife said, he is holy. His superstitious feelings made him fear that Jesus was the enemy of his gods, and his cowardice filled him with dread, lest Jesus, if he was a god, should wreak his vengeance upon his judge. He was both irritated and alarmed at the last words of Jesus, and he made another attempt for his release. But the Jews instantly threatened to lay an accusation against him before the emperor. This menace terrified him, and he determined to accede to their wishes, although firmly convinced in his own mind of the innocence of Jesus, and perfectly conscious that by pronouncing sentence of death upon him, he should violate every law of justice, besides breaking the promise he had made to his wife in the morning. Thus did he sacrifice Jesus to the enmity of the Jews and endeavor to stifle remorse by washing his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. Vainly dost thou pronounce these words, O Pilate, for his blood is on thy head likewise. Thou canst not wash his blood from thy soul as thou dost from thy hands. Those fearful words, his blood be upon us and upon our children, had scarcely ceased to resound when Pilate commenced his preparations for passing sentence. He called for the dress which he wore on state occasions, put a species of diadem set in precious stones on his head, changed his mantle, and caused a staff to be carried before him. He was surrounded with soldiers, preceded by officers belonging to the tribunal and followed by scribes who carry rolls of parchments and books used for inscribing names and dates. One man walked in front, who carried the trumpet. The procession marked in this order from Pilate's palace to the forum, where an elevated seat used on these particular occasions was placed opposite to the pillar where Jesus was scourged. This tribunal was called Gabbatha. It was a kind of round terrace, ascended by means of staircases. On, top, on the top was a seat for Pilate, and behind this seat a bench for those in minor offices, while a number of soldiers were stationed round the terrace and upon the staircases. Many of the Pharisees had left the palace and were gone to the temple, so that Annas, Caiaphas, and twenty-eight priests alone followed the Roman governor on to the forum, and the two thieves were taken there at the time that Pilate presented our Savior to the people, saying, Ecce Omo. Our Lord was still clothed in his purple garment, his crown of thorns upon his head, and his hands manacled, when the archers brought him up to the tribunal and placed him between the two malefactors. As soon as Pilate was seated, he again addressed the enemies of Jesus in these words, Behold, your king! But the cries of crucify him, crucify him, resounded on all sides. Shall I crucify your king? said Pilate. We have no king but Caesar, responded the high priests. Pilate found that it was utterly hopeless to say anything more, and therefore commenced his preparations for passing sentence. The two thieves had received their sentence of crucifixion some time before, but the high priest had obtained a respite for them in order that our Lord might suffer the additional ignominy of being executed with two criminals of the most infamous description. The crosses of the two thieves were by, by their sides that intended for our Lord was not brought because he was not as yet sentenced to death. The Blessed Virgin, who had retired to some distance after the scourging of Jesus, again approached to hear the sentence of death pronounced upon her son and her God. Jesus stood in the midst of the archers at the foot of the staircase leading up to the tribunal. The trumpet was sounded to demand silence, and then the cowardly, the base judge, in a tremulous, undecided voice, pronounced the sentence of death on the just man.
the sight of the cowardice and duplicity of this despicable being who was nevertheless puffed up with pride at his important position almost overcame me, and the ferocious joy of the executioners, the triumphant countenances of the high priests, added to the deplorable condition to which our loving Savior was reduced, and the agonizing grief of his beloved mother still further increased my pain. I looked up again and saw the cruel jewels almost devouring their victim with their eyes, the soldiers standing coldly by, and multitudes of horrible demons passing to and fro and mixing in the crowd. I felt that I ought to have been in the place of Jesus, my beloved spouse, for the sentence would not then have been unjust, but I was so overcome with anguish, and my sufferings were so intense that I cannot exactly remember all that I did see. However, I will relate, I will relate all as nearly as I can. <coughs> After a long preamble, which was composed principally of the most pompous and exaggerated eulogy of the Emperor Tiberius, Pilate spoke of the accusations which had been brought against Jesus by the high priests. He said that they had condemned him to death for having disturbed the public peace and broken their laws by calling himself the Son of God and King of the Jews, and that the people had unanimously demanded that their decree should be carried out. Notwithstanding his oft-repeated conviction of the innocence of Jesus, this mean and worthless judge was not ashamed of saying that he likewise considered their decision a just one, and that he should therefore pronounce sentence, which he did in these words, I condemn Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, to be crucified, and he ordered the executioners to bring the cross. I think I remember likewise that he took a long stick in his hands, broke it, and threw the fragments at the feet of Jesus. On hearing these words of Pilate, the mother of Jesus became for a few moments totally unconscious, for she was now certain that her beloved son must die the most ignominious and the most painful of all deaths. John and the holy women carried her away to prevent the heartless beings who surrounded them from adding crime to crime by jeering at her grief. But no sooner did she revive a little than she begged to be taken again to each spot which had been sanctified by the sufferings of her son in order to bedew them with her tears. And thus did the mother of our Lord in the name of the church take possession of those holy places. Pilate then wrote down the sentence, and those who stood behind him copied it out three times. The words which he wrote were quite different from those he had pronounced. I could see plainly that his mind was dreadfully agitated. An angel of wrath appeared to guide his hand. The substance of the written sentence was this, I have been compelled, for fear of an insurrection, to yield to the wishes of the high priests, the Sanhedrin, and the people who tumultuously demand the death of Jesus of Nazareth, whom they accused of having disturbed the public peace and also of having blasphemed and broken their laws. I have given him up to them to be crucified, although their accusations appear to be groundless. I have done so for fear of their alleging to the emperor that I encourage insurrections and cause dissatisfaction among the Jews by denying them the rights of justice. He then wrote the inscription for the cross while his clerks copied out the sentence several times that these copies might be sent to distant parts of the country. The high priests were extremely dissatisfied at the words of the sentence, which they said were not true, and they clamorously surrounded the tribunal to endeavor to persuade him to alter the inscription and not to put King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate was vexed and answered impatiently, What I have written, I have written. They were likewise anxious that the cross of our Lord should not be higher than those of the two thieves, but it was necessary for it to be so, because there would otherwise not have been sufficient place for Pilate's inscription. They therefore endeavored to, persu to persuade him not to have this obnoxious inscription put up at all. But Pilate was determined, and their words made no impression upon him. The cross was therefore obliged to be lengthened by a fresh bit of wood. Consequently, the form of the cross was peculiar. The two arms stood out like the branches of a tree growing from the stem, and the shape was very like that of the letter Y, with the lower part lengthened so as to rise between the arms, which had been put on, put on separately and were thinner than the body of the cross. A piece of wood was likewise nailed at the bottom of the cross for their feet to rest upon.
During the time that Pilate was pronouncing the iniquitous sentence, I saw his wife Claudia Proclus send him back the pledge which he had given her, and in the evening she left his palace and joined the friends of our Lord, who concealed her in a subterranean vault in the house of Lazarus at Jerusalem. Later in the same day, I likewise saw a friend of our Lord engrave the words, Eudex in Justus, and the name of Claudia Proclus on a green looking stone, which was behind the terrace called Gabatha. This stone is still to be found in the foundations of a church or house at Jerusalem, which stands on the spot formerly called Gabatha. Claudia Proclus became a Christian, followed St. Paul, and became his particular friend. No sooner had Pilate pronounced sentence than Jesus was given up into the hands of the archers, and the clothes with which, which he had taken off in the court of Caiaphas were brought for him to put on again. I think <clears throat> some charitable persons had washed them, for they looked clean. The ruffians who surrounded Jesus untied his hands for his dress to be changed and roughly dragged off the scarlet mantle with which they had clothed him in mockery, thereby reopening all his wounds. He put on his own linen undergarment with trembling hands, and they threw his scapular over his shoulders. As the crown of thorns was too large and prevented the seamless robe which his mother had made from him for him from going over his head, they pulled it off violently, heedless of the pain thus inflicted upon him. His white woolen dress was next thrown over his shoulder, and then his wide belt and cloak. After this, they again tied round his waist a ring covered with sharp iron points, and to it they fastened the cords by which he was led, doing all with their usual brutal cruelty. The two thieves were standing, one on the right and the other on the left of Jesus, with their hands tied and a chain round their necks. They were covered with black and livid marks, the effects of the scourging of the previous day. The demeanor of the one who was afterwards converted was quiet and peaceable, whilst that of the other, on the contrary, was rough and insolent, and he joined the archers in abusing and insulting Jesus, who looked upon his two companions with love and compassion, and offered up his sufferings for their salvation. The archers gathered together all the implements necessary for the crucifixions, and prepared everything for the terrible and painful journey to Calvary. Annas and Caiaphas at last left off, disputing with Pilate, and angrily retired, taking with them the sheets of parchment on which the sentences, on which the sentence was written. They went away in haste, fearing that they should get to the temple too late for the paschal sacrifice. Thus did the high priests, unknowingly to themselves, leave the true paschal lamb. They went to a temple made of stone to immolate and to sacrifice that lamb, which was but a symbol, and they left the true paschal lamb, who was being led to the altar of the cross by the cruel executioners. They were most careful not to contract exterior defilement, while their souls were completely defiled by anger, hatred, and envy. They had said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And by these words, they had performed the ceremony and had placed the hand of the sacrificer upon the head of the victim. Thus were the two paths formed, the one leading to the altar belonging, belonging to the Jewish law the other leading to the altar of grace. Pilate, that proud and irresolute pagan, that slave of the world, who trembled in the presence of the true God and yet adored his false gods, took a middle path and returned to his palace. The iniquitous sentence was given at about 10 in the morning.